There are two more topics, advanced topics that we would like to consider. I'll just mention them here and maybe later in the course we'll talk about them. First is, remember, when you're talking about, for example, people who accept loans, or if you're talking about evaluating which tax returns are fraudulent, or who are the people who are going to buy luxury cars. Now, in all of these cases, the success cases are going to be very rare in your data. So, for example, if you consider 100,000 people, only 300 of them may be actually buying a luxury car. So, in your uh, training data, you're going to have very few success cases. Okay. So, what you really want to do, uh, and therefore, what will happen is that the model has very little information based on which it can understand the success cases. Okay. And here again, what we are saying is, let's say you've got 100,000 uh, cases in your data. Out of these 100,000 cases, let's say there are only 1,000 cases that indicate a success value, namely, let's say, buying a luxury car. Now, if you do a random sampling to create your basic data, and let's say out of these 100,000 cases, you pick uh, 5,000 cases, and if you do this totally randomly, then you're going to get a very small number of success cases in your data set. Okay? And that is going to give your model very little opportunity to learn about the characteristics of these success cases. And therefore, what we'll tend to do is when you've got rare cases, we'll tend to create our data set not with a totally random sampling of the data we have. So we may say we've got 10,000 cases, uh, sorry, 100,000 cases of which we're going to select 5,000, but we're not going to select this 5,000 fully randomly. Right? So we'll say even though there are only 1,000 success cases in the 100,000, I'm going to have my data set disproportionately reflect the success cases, right? So if you had chosen randomly, you would get, uh, uh, let's say of the 100,000 cases, I said 1,000. So 1% is your success cases. So in 5,000, you'll have only 50 success cases. Now we'll say, no, we are not going to do that. In 5,000, I'll include of the original 1,000, I'll include, let us say, uh, 300 of the success cases. So in my 5,000, I will have 300 success and 4,700 failure cases, which is not, and the success cases here are far more than 1%. This is what is called oversampling for rare cases. Okay. Of course, when you do oversampling, there are other corrections that need to be employed when you in interpret your results, but you may need to do oversampling so that you give your model enough opportunities to learn about these cases. That's one important thing. And the other important thing is that you may have asymmetric costs. That is, uh, initially we assume that all errors are equal. That is, classifying somebody who's likely to buy a luxury car as someone who is not likely to buy. That's one kind of error. Another kind of error is classifying somebody who is not going to buy as a buyer. If you go simply by the total error rate and say, I want to build a model that has a minimum error rate, right? then what you're effectively saying is both types of errors are the same. Whereas in reality, it is okay for us to classify a non-buyer as a buyer, for example, luxury cars. Let's say you took somebody who is actually not likely to be a buyer and you classified them as a buyer. Then the cost you incurred may be, let's say, $100 the cost of sending the brochure and maybe the cost of allowing them to test drive the vehicle and maybe some lunch or dinner or something, maybe a total of $100, right? So that is the cost when you classify somebody who is not a buyer as a buyer. Now, if you take somebody who is a buyer and classify them as a non-buyer, then what is your cost? Well, suppose they had bought your luxury car at $75,000 and maybe the profit from that whole deal for your dealership maybe $5,000 or $10,000. So if you took them and classified them as a non-buyer, then your loss could be $5,000 or $10,000, right? So this mistake is far more costly than the other mistake, which is what we mean by saying 
asymmetric costs. So in the case of asymmetric costs, once again, you will have to simply say, uh, you will have to weight the tree in such a way that it's more likely to make uh, the other mistake than the more costly mistake. Right. So we'll see a hands-on example of this later on just to see the impact of this. And again, this is something that uh, I consider as an advanced topic. We'll talk about this later in the course as well. Okay, now what I'd like to do is to just show you a demo, a rattle demo of a cart. And for now, what I would say is just watch what I'm doing in the video. I've got a very detailed handout that walks you through this whole process step by step. Right, so I would say now just watch what I'm doing. Later on, use my handout and go through the steps very carefully. Let's now look at how to use Rattle for card classification and regression trees. So what we'll do is we'll first just take the example data set that the Rattle package comes with, the weather data set, and we'll work through it and do various kinds of analyses. Now what I want you to do is just carefully observe what I'm doing, mainly because I've got a detailed hands-on exercise that walks you through step by step uh, whatever I'm doing here. So at this point, rather than trying to follow along and trying to do it as the video goes on, I would suggest just listen carefully, watch what I'm doing, and then I'll walk you through step by step in the hands-on activity, which is documented, it's printed, uh, so you can look at it and step by step do it at your own pace. That's the idea here. Okay, so with that preamble, I'm going to start off. I'm starting R from my desktop. So this is a fresh, I'm just starting. So I'm going to load rattle. So before we do that, I have to, of course, issue the command library rattle. What this does is it loads the library and then we need to execute the command rattle to actually start rattle. Now, unlike our commander, where you just said library our commander and our commander started up, uh, that's because the library itself had a way to start our commander. Rattle is not written that way. That's the only difference. So I'm going to start rattle. And that's the command rattle, open bracket, close bracket. And it starts up rattle, it takes a little bit of time, at least on my laptop. Okay, so rattle is up and running. So the first thing we want to do is to load the weather data set that comes with rattle. Now, there are two ways to load it. One is to know exactly where the data set is located on your laptop installation and then find it, but that's a roundabout way. Uh, what I would just say is, as soon as you start Rattle, don't select anything, just hit execute. When you do that, of course, the default was spreadsheet, so it's looking for a CSV file. What it's saying is, well, you haven't selected any file, should I load the example weather data set? Okay, so that's a good idea. That's the data set we want. So we just go ahead and take the default. So the weather data set has been loaded. And uh, you can see that the weather data set has lots of columns. In fact, it has 24 variables. Uh, but essentially what it's doing is based on several variables, you know, things like rainfall, evaporation, sunshine, etc., etc., for a particular day, it has information about whether it rained on the following day. Okay, so we've got information for many days and for each day we've got various points of information that have been recorded and there is also information about whether it rained on the following day. So clearly this is a data set that we can use in order to predict whether it's going to rain on the following day or not because that's the kind of information we have. Okay. So as a preparation, we have loaded it. But of course, as you know, in Rattle, before you do any analysis, you have to indicate to it what are the input variables and so on. So I'm going to say, ignore the date, ignore the location, which means don't consider these in the model, because both of those are simply uh, identifying factors, identifying the rows of data. They, they won't play any role in actually predicting. Uh, let's keep all of these other things here. And there's also a risk data, which also I'm going to ignore. 
okay so uh, what we are trying to say is the target variable is whether it's going to rain tomorrow now let's take a quick look at the data that is available for every I click on edit and of course it's got lots of columns we can keep scrolling for every row it's got information on whether it rained on the following day or not and that is categoric it's yes and no which is good but other than that it's got date and location which are you know the date doesn't really affect this because it's all days in a particular month and the location is fixed so both of these we're not going to use to predict but we're going to use all the other variables like minimum temperature maximum temperature what was the rainfall what was the evaporation what was the sun sunshine and so on okay so that's what we are going to use to do the modeling so we are actually set on this tab but since we made some changes we have to hit execute again and we can now see that it's got uh, okay I'm going to make this ignore execute and so we see now that this is all uh, the risk variable I'm going to again say ignore it so we've got the three variables which are ignored and all the rest are are fine rain tomorrow is the target variable three variables have been ignored and we will partition it because this is a supervised learning process so we will use the training partition which which is going to consist of 70 percent of the data so as you can see from here because this is identifying information there are 366 observations of that it's going to partition 70 percent for training 15 percent for validation 15 percent for test so that's it we can now go to the model tab and the default option in the model tab is tree which is the cart decision tree analysis so the cart uh, the tree option is what we're going to use for cart and there are some default values here for now we're just going to take all the default values and simply say go ahead and execute the model so it's gone ahead executed the model and it's actually showing us the output here okay and then it says n equals 256 we saw that there were 366 rows of data if you go back to the data tab we see that there were 366 unique rows however in the model tab it says that it used only 256 why is that if you really think about it it's pretty obvious why it used only 256 because it used only the training partition which consisted of 70 percent of the data so approximately 70 percent of 366 uh, is roughly 256 so another 15 percent is for validation another 15 percent is for test okay so it's created the model actually this is the decision tree here but it may not be very difficult uh, may not be very easy for us to understand what this is saying what i suggest is well why don't you just click on why don't we click on draw and look at a diagrammatic representation of the tree so the way in which rattle shows the decision tree is slightly different from what are my slides showed earlier but the information contained is exactly the same okay so what it's showing us is this is a root node and the basis on which the root node was split is indicated above that so in the root node it is saying default is no rain that is before any splits the prediction would be no rain because 84 percent of the 256 rows indicate days in which there was no rain on the following day right so only 16 percent of the cases it actually rained we know that because uh, days on which it rains are much fewer than days on which it doesn't rain and therefore the data clearly indicates that a majority is no rain so at this point suppose you had given you were given no additional information you're not a suppose you had created a decision tree with just this one node then your prediction would be it's not going to rain tomorrow irrespective of any other information because you would be right 84 percent of the time if you simply said that because most of the days it doesn't rain 
okay but what this tree is showing us is that the split was on uh, was based on the pressure at 3 pm and what it says is if the pressure at 3 pm was greater than or equal to 1012 then yes is on the left no is on the right okay so as uh, slightly different from the way in which i had shown in my slides the lower value was on the left the higher value was on the right here it's different but it doesn't matter since they have already labeled it as yes and no okay so if the pressure was greater than or equal to 10 12 then the decision depends upon the cloud condition at 3 pm and if that was less than 7.5 then the again the yes branches on the left the no branches on the right so then it says the decision is going to be no because 95 percent of those cases are no okay now notice that there is still a five percent error in this because 95 percent are no which means five percent were yes and yet it didn't proceed with the decision tree below this now we already know from our example that with more splits it would have been possible for us to get uh, an exact tree, a pure tree in which every one of the leaf nodes is 100% correct. We could do that. But of course, we know that that leads to overfitting. So what has happened is that Rattle has gone ahead, built the complete tree, and then pruned the tree back to avoid overfitting. And this is the optimum tree that Rattle has determined for us which is why it doesn't have 100% accuracy, okay? So you can see here that if the pressure was greater than 1012, if the cloud was greater than or equal to 7.5, then it is going to rain the following day with only a probability of 67%, and there were nine such cases, and so on, okay? So if the pressure was greater than 1012, and sunshine was greater than 8.9, then it's unlikely to be rain tomorrow on the following day, meaning 80% of the days it didn't rain, only 20% of the days it rained. But if sunshine was less than, that is the no branch, was less than 8.9, then 74% probability is that it's going to rain tomorrow because of the 27 cases, 74% of the days it had actually rained. So that's the decision tree. So even though there were lots and lots of variables, Rattle, based on its analysis, figured out that these are the only three important variables which will help us to perform a prediction the other variables don't seem to be very useful for prediction okay so this is really the decision tree that rattle has provided us okay let's do one thing quickly since we've got the tree before we analyze some of the other information that rattle has output for us here so before we look at some of the other information let's go ahead and take a look at how this tree performs on the training data, the validation data, and the test data. We already know the performance on the training data. We can figure it out from this, but we can do that much more conveniently from here. So to see how well our model performed, we click on the Evaluate tab. We'll be doing this for many of the other models that we build. And first, let's see how the model performed on the training data, right? But the moment you select this, Rattle is going to jump at us and say, well, you know what, you really shouldn't be evaluating your model on performance on the training data because that's not good. We'll nevertheless take a look at it. So we click this, the moment we say execute, Rattle jumps up and says, you know, you shouldn't be using the training data, be careful, etc. That's fine because performance on the training data is not a good indicator of how good the model is. But we want to learn how to interpret the result so let's look at the training data so on the training data what rattle is showing us is the error matrix okay on all classification models on all classification algorithms and models the way we will analyze how good they are is by looking at their error matrix okay what is this great thing called error matrix it's very easy so what it says is on the column, you have the actual values. On the row, you have the predicted values. What it's saying is, of the actual values, there were a total of 215 no values. That is, out of 266 on uh, 256, on 215 days, 
it actually did not rain okay because the no column no row if you total it it is 215 but of those 215 days on which uh, it didn't rain on the following day our model predicted correctly only for 205 so the model was actually wrong on 10 days of the 256 similarly there were a total of 41 days on which it actually rained on the following day but the model only corrected correctly predicted 26 of them it was wrong on 15 of them so totally speaking the model was wrong of the 256 cases the model was wrong on 25 cases okay so that's the idea here so roughly 10 percent error rate is the model so this first error is showing us the absolute numbers of actual versus predicted the matrix at the bottom is showing almost the same information except instead of absolute numbers it's showing us the percentages okay so 205 is roughly 80 percent of the 256 data points we had and so on okay so we can easily look at this matrix the percentage matrix and figure out that the total error rate was 10 percent okay it got four percent of the no's wrong and it got six percent of the yes is wrong and of course it's showing us here the overall error rate is 0 0.097 which is close to 0.1 or 10 percent okay so that the, that was the performance on the training data training partition now let's take a look at what the performance was on the validation partition so we click validation click on execute and we see that in the validation partition our error rate was 18 percent okay so it's got it got nine percent of the no's wrong and nine percent of the yes is wrong so total error rate was 18 percent on the validation partition finally let's take a look at how it did on the test partition and you see the error rate is 20 percent a little higher than on the validation partition you expect that because in this model in classification and regression trees in cart modeling we actually use the validation partition for choosing the best tree as part of the pruning process validation data is actually used and that is why we would expect that performance on the test partition would be slightly inferior to that on the validation partition so that's basically the analysis in rattle of uh, you know how to do cart so it's pretty straightforward but when you do it just make sure that you follow the steps in exactly the order in which i had indicated in fact you don't have to get uh, worried about noting down any of these things because all of these steps that i've just carried out have been documented in a hands-on exercise in a lab document which i have made available for you so you can look at the document and actually do exactly what i've done here step by step you can follow all of these things okay now let's go back to the model tab and look at the textual output which exactly corresponds to the graphical output here okay the textual output says the root node has 256 cases of which there were 41 cases which were wrongly classified because the root node it is classifying as a no because it's got a majority of no's so it says if you have to build a tree with just this one node the decision is going to be no okay so that way if it said no it's going to be wrong on 41 cases which is 16 percent error rate but of course that's not the we are not using the tree with just one node so the first split is on pressure 3 pm greater than or equal to 1011.9 which it has rounded off as 1012 uh, so in that node if it is true then it comes to this point here and it says this is also a no but it says it is 92 percent of the cases are still yes 16 cases are still yes so 92 percent of the cases are are no which is why this node is classified as a no but of course you've got 16 individual cases which are actually yes that is how you interpret each of these nodes of course you can see here that it's also giving you the probabilities of no's and yeses okay so 92.15 which is rounded off as 92 that is percentage of yeses and of course the rest is 
percentage of nodes okay so that is how you uh, perform cart on rattle okay let's take a look at some of these settings that we have in fact i don't discuss these settings in my lab handout so i just talk about them here it says min split and you can change these if you want but the defaults work well enough for our purposes the defaults should do fine what it says is if don't perform a split if either the node itself has less than 20 uh, 20 cases or if as a result of splitting you're going to create any node with 20 cases in which case don't perform a split okay so that's what it's showing uh, which is how many nodes how many cases must an individual node have in order for it to be considered for splitting okay min bucket is what is the minimum size of a bucket that you will consider which is in some sense a pruning uh, category a pruning parameter okay so you can see here that none of the boxes none of the final buckets have less than equal to less than seven cases okay so if there is a bucket which has less than seven cases uh, it's going to just roll it back into its parent it's not going to consider a separate node with seven cases these are just the default one maximum depth don't go beyond 30 deep of the tree and complexity okay and this was the alpha factor that we spoke about in our uh, uh, in the lecture okay so these we'll just leave them alone for our particular uh, modeling purposes in, in this course but later on if you're interested if you pursue this topic further uh, you might read about this and try to do something with it